Good morning, flock, from our beautiful nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Obviously, it's a few hours earlier here than it is there where you are this morning. And I'll tell you, my family and I have already visited many of the sites and memorials here. And my son-in-law, Sean, has been so faithful to chronicle all of these things for you to see throughout the message this morning. Uh, we were so humbled. We're moved beyond words to witness the fireworks uh, last night on the very steps of the Capitol building that you see behind us, the seat of our government uh, for our nation's 244th birthday. Like most of you, I am blessed to have been born within 6% of the world's population that call this great republic home. Though we undoubtedly live in the grandest nation on earth, obviously we are not without our fair share of problems. Uh, but even with all these problems, there's nowhere else on this earth I would rather live, and I'm sure most of you would agree and say the same. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 12, 48. He said, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from everyone who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. America has been blessed from border to border with abundant resources. And with great blessing comes greater responsibilities and unfortunately, even bigger problems. It goes without saying that solving problems within a family or a church family involves all of the family members getting together and working on those problems. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. How many of you, as I did, grew up starting every school day saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? Some of you also remember reciting the poem, In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Remember that? You and I are living through a period when many of the historical figures we studied in school as American heroes are now being criticized. But listen to what Christopher Columbus wrote down as his own purpose for setting out for the new world in 1492. His words, Our Lord opened to my understanding, for I could sense his hand upon me, so it became clear to my understanding that the voyage was feasible. Who doubts that this illumination was from the Holy Spirit? I attest that he, that is the Holy Spirit, with marvelous rays of light, consoled me through the holy and sacred scriptures. And if the purpose is purely for his holy service, the sign which convinces me that our Lord is hastening the end of the world, get this, is the preaching of the gospel recently in so many lands. Now, obviously, Christopher Columbus was familiar with the words of Jesus found in Matthew 24, 14, whenever he said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Columbus was only one of many settlers who would give spiritual cause to their European monarchs, that is, their kings and their queens, as to why they wanted to come to the New World in the first place. You see, the charters written for the earliest American settlements and colonies had to include a purpose for settling a particular region. Whenever I lived in Noble many years ago, I was part of a, a committee that helped write a charter to help our town become a city. You had to have a, a city charter. You see, the charters written for the earliest American settlements and colonies had to include a purpose for settling a particular region. And we have numerous, and I mean numerous, historical records existing giving us undeniable evidence as to these purposes. A colony founded in Virginia in 1606, a year before Jamestown in 1607, stated their purpose, listen, to make habitation into that part of America commonly called Virginia in propagating of Christian religion to such people as yet living in darkness. In 1609, another charter for Virginia stated, the principal effect which we can desire or expect of this action is the conversion of the people in these parts unto the true worship of God and Christian religion. 
Most of you remember from your history classes the pilgrims uh, landing in the Mayflower at Plymouth Rock in 1620. Even before leaving the ship, the pilgrims drafted and signed what was called the Mayflower Compact. You remember that? Which declared, having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement of the Christian faith, we combine ourselves together for furtherance of the ends foresaid. That's to share the gospel with the Native Americans. William Bradford was a leader of the pilgrims, and he later wrote their purpose for coming to the New World as a great hope, an inward zeal they had in laying some good foundation for the propagating and advancing of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Now, the Puritans followed just 10 years later in 1630 as fellow members of Christ entered into covenant with him for this work. For we must consider that we shall be, get this, as a city upon a hill, an obvious reference to Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 14. Did you know that 52 and possibly as many as 54 of the original 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence were thought to be devout Christians. Many had seminary degrees, as nearly all the earliest uh, American colleges and universities were founded by either churches or by ministers, including Yale and Harvard. As a whole, our founding fathers believed that divine providence a living God, the hand of Almighty God, played a crucial role in the birth of this great nation, the United States of America. They believed it so much that, listen, the closing words to the Declaration of Independence stated, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, not many folks know this, but five of the 56 who signed the Declaration of Independence were captured by the British and tortured, put to death as traitors. Twelve had their homes destroyed. Two lost sons in the war. Nine of the signers actually fought and died from wounds or hardships in the Revolutionary War. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now, though that specific verse applied to Israel at that time, the principle is true for individuals, families, co communities, and even nations. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence that God placed in the hearts and minds of flawed men, and we're all flawed, including our, our founding fathers, to lay a foundation of biblical truth that America would be built upon. Certainly all men are fallible, and, and those who now enjoy freedom, think about this, those who enjoy the very freedom bought at so high a price and are now seeking to disparage those who provide and defend that freedom should at least pause and look at themselves deeply in the mirror. They should ponder the inevitable consequences of their actions. Our founding fathers envisioned a nation where its citizens were taught the word of God in all schools. In, in this manner, the average American citizen had a moral compass with which to gauge the actions of its governing officials to the truth of the Bible and to hold their leaders accountable. The Bible was the primary textbook in American classrooms and remained so unchallenged until 1844. Hi. I'm standing in front of the building that houses the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court in all of our land. You know, there are three branches of government that serves as checks and balances within the United States. We have the executive branch, that is the president, who carries out the laws. We have the legislative, that is Congress, who make the laws. And then we have the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, and the lower courts who evaluate and interpret our laws. In 1844, the following decision was handed down by the Supreme Court in the matter of a certain school in Philadelphia that sought to discontinue the practice of prayer and Bible reading. They just didn't want to do it anymore. 
the, the court's decision read as follows. Why may not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as divine revelation in the schools? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or perfectly as from the New Testament? Bravo! Praise God! And yet, 118 years later, the Supreme Court reversed itself in the 1962 and 63 rulings that said the prayer and Bible reading in the public schools is now considered unconstitutional. Did the Constitution change? No. Men change. Every plan must begin with someone making a move. And the first move towards socialism were being taken to remove from young minds any future knowledge and dependence on God. You know, the Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, it's one of my favorite. Uh, it's bone chilling, but it's, it's still one of my favorites. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Even if American children were being raised in homes where the Bible was not taught, and many were, at least they were exposed to its teachings in the public school system. It's, is it a coincidence that we have seen such a downward spiral in our nation's sense of morality beginning in the 1960s? I don't think so. You know, the Lincoln Memorial long been one of my favorites. Built to honor the 16th president, it was dedicated on May of 1922. It has 36 columns, and above each of the columns is the name of a state that was part of the Union when Lincoln was president. The monument has continued to be the focus of race relations in America to this day. In fact, on August 28, 1963, 250,000 people lined both sides of the reflecting pool. From here, where Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech all the way to the Washington Monument. Many believe that, and uh, there were those who heard him actually confess that he was. Uh, he, he did know his scripture, and he addressed the probability of divine providence in the Civil War, posted on one wall of the Lincoln Memorial. He suggested that the horrific death and destruction of the war was God's retribution for the injustice of slavery. Listen to this. He said, every drop of blood drawn by the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword. Lincoln also quoted Psalm 19.9, which says, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Sitting on 18 acres, the White House has been the official residence of every United States president since John Adams in the year 1800. And his wife, Abigail Adams, prayed a blessing upon moving in. And this is what she prayed. I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and upon all who hereafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was so moved by that blessing that he had it carved into the mantle of the state dining room. Thank you all. Of course. Uh, I appreciate you know, no matter your political affiliation, the Bible encourages us in Hebrews 13, 17. Listen, obey your leaders, 
submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. You see how relevant that is today? It's been a joy for me and Nancy to be here in our nation's capital uh, with our children and our grandchildren. I mean, even in these messed up, deeply troubled times. And it served to remind me of our many blessings uh, and of our responsibilities as United States citizens and as citizens of the kingdom of God. God bless you. In today republic for which is dance, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.